Good morning, People's Church of Town. It is such a blessing to be here. Some of you know me. Some of you are like, why are everybody clapping because they announced this name? It's because I, we were here a long time ago. Nothing to really talk about. But <laughs> this is my wife, Dorothy Wilkes. You want to say something to everybody, Dorothy? Yeah. That's good, good. And so I, you guys, so, like some of you know, some of you don't know, uh, Dorothy and I, we came to be a part of People's Church Uptown. Uh, it wasn't called People's Church back then, but back in 2001. And an interesting thing happened in 2003. I was invited out to lunch by uh, my pastor, Chris Beard at that time, and he asked me if I would consider leaving a good job at Procter & Gamble. A real good job at P&G. Y'all familiar with that organization? Yeah. A good job. And come on staff. And um, in, in God's wisdom, God actually allowed me to pray about that. And in 2004, my wife and I transitioned to be on staff here back then, and we served from 2004 to 2014. And the reason why I mention that is because in that lunch meeting, I didn't know, but uh, my life changed. My life went from being, uh, you know, not, not I, you know, I used to, we were we were good, we were good Christians, you know, <laughs> we, we we gave every other Sunday or something like that, and we came to church regularly. But it was at that point in time that I was called from sitting on the sidelines to actually get in the game. And Chris and Jan Beard literally changed our lives. And I mention that because I believe that they've done something like that for a lot of us here. Through the People's Church Network, they've helped to plant churches across the globe for What's this, 2023? For 24 years now, they have been the lead pastors here at People's Church, setting the vision of being a racially reconciling, generation-rich, life-giving church, thriving in the heart of the city. That was, God breathed that through their lives. <laughs> Amen. There are a lot of other people here whose lives have been changed, and I'm going to ask that our elder board of the People's Church Network come and join me on stage just for a moment. Right now, Chris is stirring in his heart. He's trying to figure, except for the beards. Y'all can stay seated. Many of you may have known, but Chris and Jan Beard, they left the missions field because God had given them a heart for ministry across the globe. But God had also told them that you're supposed to lead this church that they grew up in and Pastor Miller was leading, and they were supposed to do something here in Cincinnati. So there was a lot of messages, and if you heard their testimony, they actually mourned leaving the missions field, but were excited about coming here. It was this weird thing that was going on in their life, and they had to make a decision, and they made the decision to come here. And then God continued to work to transition this church, to help minister to many pastors in the city with their heart for racial unity, racial reconciliation, justice, missions, and all that. And then God put a heart on them for people's churches across the city and across the United States and across the globe, and they led in birthing the People's Church Network, which is now 10 churches from here in Cincinnati to St. Louis, L.A., to, to South Africa, Split Croatia, Honduras, which is growing. And we felt like this was a good time, that we actually invited them to come up here. Now you could come. Now come. <laughs> And you can stand right here because there's a point in the Bible when God asked Moses to, uh, I believe it was uh, uh, anoint Aaron by pouring oil and pouring down like 
oil in front of the We're not going to anoint you with oil right now. <laughs> we thought about it, but I didn't, I didn't plan for it. But you are global pastors. You are not only pastors here from Cincinnati, but your ministry, your lives, your reach, all of the ministry work that you have done, it's, it's, it's beyond what God has called you to do in Cincinnati. It's across the globe. And we felt like today would be a good day that we just really put that mantle on you. Not that you've asked for it, not that you want, maybe even want it, probably would shy away from it, but you're, you're not only just a lead pastor here to people's church, and you're not only our, my inspiration, the inspiration of a lot of people here and calling us to ministry, and yes, Jesus did it, but he used you too. He used you. He could have did it by himself, but he used you. <laughs> and you were obedient to you. So we want to call you, these, may I introduce to you Chris and Jan Beard, global pastors, of People's Church Network. Can we give them? We have a gift for you. And I'm going to ask the elder board if we could just come and pray for them just brief. And here, if you would just raise your hands, lean them more this way and pray in agreements with us. I'll lead us in prayer, but we just want to honor you, bless you, and give thanks to God for you. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for Chris and Jan Beard, Lord. We thank you for the ministry that you have done through their lives for so many years, Lord. We thank you for the, the obedience that they have, have been able to walk in through the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord. You anointed them at such a young age to do ministry, and you've given them strength. You've given them patience, Lord. You've given them energy. You've given them wisdom. Lord, we thank you for all that you've given them so that they can pour out into this body of believers and body of believers across the globe, Lord. We thank you for that. And, Lord, we honor them for being obedient to your call, being obedient in all that you've called them to. And, Lord, we anoint them today, our pastors and our global pastors of People's Church Network, so that, Lord, that you can continue to do the work that you have been doing through them and that they feel the freedom to do it wherever God calls them. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You all probably recognize that they didn't know that was coming. But the Bible tells us to give honor where honor is due. And for a long period of time, um, I've known, and I think our elder board staff known, and everybody's known that God has called them to do such spectacular things. And uh, we want to make sure that you guys know that, that we bless you and honor you. And we, we're keeping you, but we release you at the same time. If you understand that, don't go nowhere, but feel... <laughs> But at the same time, as God calls you to, to the ends of the earth to do what you're going to do, do it. Bless you. Amen. Chris and Jan's leadership has, from this network as a whole has allowed us to grow. It has allowed us to do some pretty spectacular things. It has allowed us to learn a lot in the process. We have learned so much it's hard to even explain it all in such a short period of time, but one thing that I, I can tell you, the, probably the most significant thing that we have learned as People's Church Network is church planning is hard. <laughs> Preach. So, you know, um, Preach. <laughs> Christianity Today says that 80% of churches that are planted or started won't make it to their 50th anniversary. Yeah, that's, that's pretty sad. And you know, if you've ever tried to start a business, business stats say only half of those will fail. So relatively speaking, church planning is significantly more difficult. And we know this firsthand. Um, we started here as balcony dwellers up there, and God shoved us to Top the front. Road. Shout out to the God balcony. God shoved us to the front. And then he kind of sent us on our way to St. Louis to help plant One Church St. Louis. Um, really starting in 2013 when my job transitioned me there and then eventually brought the family in 2014. And wow, <laughs> you don't know what you're getting into till you're in it. 
But if the Lord says go, obedience is the right answer. It's the right response. Mm -hmm. So we went there with five households. We, we did our best to grind it out. And we know when God plants seeds, sometimes they're for a season and sometimes they're for returning seasons. Um, but one church, St. Louis, as we knew it, did not make it to its fifth anniversary. No. Now that said, don't be sad. God knows what he's doing. But it, it was a trying experience. And for the five couples that went, we are the remnant. We are the last remnant. family still there. So if you didn't know, church planning is hard. We were the remnant that the Lord left in St. Louis. And um, God knew we had a plan. It, it's even Church planning is even hard for the churches that make it past five years. We started People's Church St. Louis in 2017 after one church had eventually merged with another church and no longer exists. But even recognizing that our ministry work, going into praying and discipling, it's hard. We, we lead a house church, and we started with six people in our, our living room. Now we have over 40 people, and some of them will be here today. And God is doing a great work, but it's still hard. I, I'll give you an example. So it, it's hard because our, our discipleship desire is so intense. We really want to lead people to grow in Christ. And we grow in relationship and deep fellowship with people. And there, there's a young lady named Jamila who became a part of our fellowship very early on. And Jamila is love beyond love. She's the love personified, as I like to tell you. She has a heart for any and everyone. She sees people and she just weeps for them. She sees a homeless person, and she called, she called us, literally, and said, I, I want to invite them home to stay with me. And we were like, no, <laughs> let's just try to get them help with people who can, let, we, let's figure something else out. Jamila loves people so strong. She, she's like, like Russell Johnson, <laughs> 30 years younger and a woman. If you can imagine that, just, just <laughs> think about that, you know. Just love people. And that love is a good thing, but it also leads her to love sometimes the wrong people and people who want to take advantage of her. And she did. She fell into some, had some friends who would just basically use her. They would convince her to do the wrong things. And she was young. She was in her young 20s, but she grew up in the foster care system and desired family. So anyone who really acted like they were her family, she would graft herself to. And that got her into the wrong crowd, eventually got her into a drug addiction. She would come to church and she would be there for two months because she loved and she connected. It would be great. We would see growth with her and we would pour our heart and my wife would be discipler and then she would disappear for weeks and months at a time and we couldn't find her. We'd call her cell phone and she'd thrown it away. We, it would just kill us. Then she'd come back and she'd be with us again for a couple of months and we think this is the time when she's going to really connect and then she'd disappear again. Our hearts would be broken every time she left, and we'd be overjoyed every time she came back. And it was tough to the extent where eventually we asked her, we said, Jamila, would you, would you consider you know, just staying with us? Moving this grown woman into our house, and we had two kids still at home at that time, and we, we knew that God had a call on our life, and we wanted to connect with her, and we wanted, so we took that risk. And she agreed, and she stayed with us for a period of time, and that made it even harder. <laughs> but we knew this was what we were supposed to do, but eventually we realized, you know, we, we're going to need to get her more help. And by God's grace, we got her into a program called Teen Challenge. And there's, many of you may know about it, and Teen Challenge in St. Louis is great. And she went off there, and then this thing happened called the global pandemic. You may have been there. And that caused more chaos, but eventually that led her to move back into our house, and it was tough because church planning is hard. It's just the way it is. So, so it is hard, but it's also kingdom. So, you know, Jamila started out in foster care. Um, she was born into a family of, um, of drug addiction, 
And, you know, she was really trying to get her feet under her and, and move into a space where the Lord could use her. And you could see the want in her eyes. And like you said, that love personified was yeah. intense. Um, I could learn a lot from her. So she uh, was so excited when she finished Team Challenge and she was just, where can I go? How can I get there? What can I do for the Lord? Where will he send me? I want to go on this world tour and I want to just visit all these countries and see what the Lord wants me to do. And I'm like, breathe, Jamila. Um, I used to say, tranquila, Jamila, because she was always so excited and so wanting to go. And I'm like, we need you to breathe. The Lord will give you the discernment, which you need. But until then, I need you to slow down. But she kept pressing. And despite the fact that it was 2021, um, I agreed to go on a mission trip, and I agreed to take her with me because she was so in love with the Lord and wanting to serve him. And we didn't want to dampen that, but at the same time, we're still trying to <laughs> navigate. And so we get on the plane. We get on the plane, and, and we go to Haiti. And I've, I go there for a missions trip, and I did my best to discourage her. It is a difficult missions field. It is in southern, rural, mountainous Haiti. There's no running water. There's no shower for a week. They have tarantulas. They have lots of things that we don't like here you're not going to like it. And she was like, yes, let's do it. Let's go. I'm there. And I'm like, okay. So we don't even get off the tarmac and she's already got dreams and visions of what God's going to want to do with her there. And I'm thinking, Lord, let it be you and not her excitement. And true to form, we make it through the week and she's just deeper and deeper in love with the people of Haiti. And in particular, one young man um, who she would go on to marry about a year and a half later. And we have a picture of them. So Jamila and Chris Fay are miracles. Um, he didn't speak much English before we got there. And by we went there in March. By June, he was fluent enough to have a conversation <laughs> and, and continue the courting process. And, you know, when, when the Lord stirs you to, to do a thing, it's important that you respond properly. And she knew that she wanted to go there and she wanted to serve and she, she wanted to be yoked to someone who was also of that same heart. So like-minded, they agreed that this is what they would do. She would move to Haiti, contrary to what some people think about international marriages. He was not trying to come here. Mm. Um, she would actually go there and serve. And they are living in their partially finished home that she stayed behind an extra year to help build. Mm -hmm. um, and they're hosting gatherings in their home on Sundays. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Because, you know, sometimes we don't even want to invite people we know into our finished homes. But she is inviting people <laughs> into her mm -hmm. partially finished home. And to return the blessing that she received in, in through us and through other people who care for her, they are actively looking to, to raise money to bring orphans into their home. Right. So we just thank God for her. And we do know and can attest that church planning is hard, but it is kingdom. Amen. Church planning is so kingdom. We're in prayer right now for people's church, Haiti. When we, what God would do through Jamila, we don't know. She's so early and she's, she's so early in her walk as ministry leader. I mean, she's Stay with us and she served with us, but she's growing. Her heart for the Lord is over the mountains. And she is Literally learning what it means to minister the small Haitian group house. that she has right there. And um, to grow to the point where, like she said, she wants to host orphans and she wants to, I mean, she has a heart for everyone. So we always tell her, all right, pray with your husband and now see what you have. And then, you know, her husband actually has that same heart. And so we've been talking to them and coaching them and Every Sunday we have meetings with them. So God took a hard situation of us planning a church and he's turning it into something so much greater. So church planning is hard, but it's also kingdom. And every Sunday we, we meet and we get the opportunity to build and connect with people in that environment. And we love it in our, our house church environment. But I have to tell you, this Sunday I missed, I missed being here. So I love both, both in fact. Not too long ago, our People's Church group, and you see a picture up there, we took a missions trip to the Dominican Republic, that same island down there, which just draws us. And we had the opportunity to build the house. The house is behind that picture. is the house that we built in four days for um, a ministry called Casas por Cristo. And uh, it really helps people down there. And we took a team, and that's a lot of people from Dominican there with our team of 10 people, um, as well as another church that we joined with. 
During that trip, we had a couple who went with us. They said, you know, we've, we've been sitting on the sidelines. We want to be baptized. We want to really make our walk with Christ solid right here and right now. Was, the mission trip went for one reason, and it turned out to be a, a, a whole another reason, at least for our church. We sweat together. We work together. We serve together, and we love God together. And the church hardness or the difficulty of church planning, when we have stories like Jamila's and the stories of what happened there, we just know it's so kingdom. And what's great about this is that we're just one of 10 churches in this People's Church Network that recognize that church planning is hard, but church planning is also kingdom. That when God really speaks to us and calls us to do the work, it's, we have the option to respond or not to respond. And so many of us have taken that call and said, yes, we're going to do it. We're going to do this hard thing because we know it's kingdom. But the good part of this, and the really good part of this, I should say, there's so much good in it. The really good part of this is that every time we go and we start, we're taking our home and the rest of the body of Christ and people's church with us. So whether you guys know it or not, you are as much a part of the difficulty and the kingdomness of church planning as we are. We recognize that the energy that you put and sow into the work that's happening it pushes us forward. I know I'm just speaking for uh, our church, but I know the other churches out there that represent so many different types of churches. I mean, we meet in homes, and, and People's Church House to House here in Cincinnati meets in homes, but we have Mobile Church in People's Church Los Angeles that meet in four different locations, two every Sunday and on the weekends and uh, in the midweek. We have churches that are more traditional in, in South Africa, in Split Croatia, in Honduras, and they, they, they meet on Sundays and gather and do ministry in their communities. But we're all a part of people's church, and that is the strength of this network. And without you, without your prayers, without you giving, without all that you've been doing, it wouldn't happen. So today, a big part of our call and what we're asking you to do is to continue to press in to what you've always done. And we want you to continue to do that in three ways. So the first way we want you to do it is to intercede. The second, we want you to invest. And the third, we want you to invite. The first of those, I'm going to let my wife talk a little bit more about, is to intercede. So you hear folks come and they're, they give their testimonies and they're like, pray for us. We ask that first, always. And it's not because we're warming up to the invest part. It's, a, it's an all. We need all of it. <laughs> right. But we put it first because it is most powerful. Amen. And if, if we didn't learn anything on, on these, these experiences that we've had, it's that if God is not with you, don't go. Um, you need him. Right? You have the tactical help of your, your human teams, and we were extra grateful for them. I'm sure our kids were, too, because they became church staff real fast. Right. But without the warring in the spirit, you will not succeed. Amen. Amen. So why might a church planner need you to intercede for them? So imagine this. You pack up your family. They go across the country. They get into an environment they don't know. They have to enroll in schools. They, they don't know these people. St. Louis, for us, is a very closed community. It's a very divided community, but it's also a very closed community. And if you come into it, you really have to work to get into groups. So we took a middle schooler, an elementary student, and a high schooler. So you can already know why we would need somebody to intercede. <laughs> Amen. Right. So that's, that's one aspect of it. But, you know, when you're doing the work of the Lord, there are things that are going to come against you to prevent that advancement. So you have to think about the illnesses, the cars that break down, the, the traumas that might happen, the animals that get sick. We had so many strange things happen when we got to St. Louis. And, you know, not to mention the fact that you've got a day job and you've got to go door to door and you've got to shake a lot of hands and meet a lot of people. And every week you have to continue to pour into the mission that you're on to advance the kingdom of God. So, of course, we ask for you to pray, but we also know that we have a heavenly helper. And in Romans 8, 26 and 27, we know that in the same way, the spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what we ought to pray for, but the spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Right. Can you right. think of the last time you had 
the posture of wordless groans? Because the spirit can speak words, right? He has the option. (laughs) The Lord can give him words, and he speaks to us all the time. But to be in a place to know that someone of such a stature and awe would go in our stead at that level of depth to ensure that we are covered and protected and moving forward in the plans that the Lord has us. Just have to pause for a second, right? It's, it's, it's a lot to take in. But it's important that we appreciate, too, all that hard work that we do and the weight that we can carry if we don't carry it correctly. Right. So I mentioned my kids because that was something very immediate, right? Before we took Jamila and we had the kids. <laughs> and, and then you have everything else going on. And again, don't forget you've got a day job, 40 hours a week. You're putting in somewhere. And my day job is a pharmacist. I don't have, <laughs> I don't have a lot of downtime. So when you get tired, when you run out of energy and you are looking and grasping at things, you know, the enemy comes in and tries to encourage you to supplement. And you have to remember that that is not your purpose. That is not your call. And whether you're on a mission field or you're at home, that is always the case. Amen. When we're weary, we still have a helper. Jesus himself said to come to him. Come to him and find rest. Amen. Learn from him and find rest for your souls. And when we're out planning a church and trying to encourage people to come to the Lord, our soul is taking a beating. So <laughs> it is important that we ask for prayer, that we are people of prayer, and that we put things on the altar and we leave it there. We put it there immediately and we do not pick it back up. It is not Christian best practice to half do it and try to put it together and then hope the Lord will come back behind you because he's a redeemer. Right. He is, right. but that is not the proper order. So we encourage you today as you listen to us and you listen to everything that happens to remember the value of prayer, the power of prayer. And if the Lord is nudging you, To know that you're not alone, even though church planning is hard, but we have an intercessor. We have multiple intercessors in the heavens. We have intercessors here. We felt that. We thank you for that. And intercession is also kingdom. Right. Your prayer strengthens every church that is part of this network. And as you lean into it, it continues to strengthen us. The second thing we want you to do is invest. Now, when we think about investment, you can think about investing your time. You can think about investing your energy. You can think about investing your talents. And you can think about investing your money. And and what I'm here to talk to you about today is investing your money. Yes. Actual cash. (laughs) Everybody's thinking, oh, man, here's another pastor to talk about. No, I'm not just talking about investing financially because... Is that what the church wants? It's because that's how the kingdom is able to work in these church plants. Through your access giving, we're able to do so much more because without it, we have churches that are often struggling. And one of those statistics that 80% that doesn't make it after five years, the vast majority of that is because financial reasons. The pastors either can't support themselves, so they have to get a job. And then once they get a other job outside of ministry, they tend to start focusing on that more than leading the ministry. And then the ministry begins to dwindle ever so more. It's a difficult thing when you're trying to lead a group of 10 people to grow it into a group of 100 people when you also have to worry about a 40-week job and the rest of your life uh, intercede, inter- or interfering with that. So I'm here to talk about investing because many of you may know for a long period of time as the, the executive pastor here, I, I was part of leading the finances and things along those lines. And for some reason, I got a reputation of being, um, I call it a good steward. <laughs> some people call it cheap. I disagree with those people. But through investing our financial resources into the kingdom, God can do so much. Yes, it all belongs to him in the beginning and to the end anyway. Bible says he owes a thousand cattle on 10,000 hills. So it all belongs to him anyway. But he uses us to resource the kingdom. And so I, I think about, when I think about giving, I think about the church in Macedonia. And in 2 Corinthians... 
Paul is writing about a church in Macedonia in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. And I, I'm going to read it now. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people, and they exceeded our expectation. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. The Macedonian churches were churches like Philippi and Thessalonica, they were in the northern part of Greece, and Corinth was in the more the southern part of Greece, and they were going through a difficult time financially, the churches and that region as a whole. They were in extreme financial poverty, and um, from that poverty, it says the poverty and their overflowing joy led to generosity. That doesn't make sense when you think about it. When you're living in extreme poverty, why in the world would you have overflowing joy? And then that leads to generosity. It goes beyond comprehension. When I, when I was reading this, I thought about a time in my life when I was younger. My mother, she had three sons. She struggled a great deal. And when times really got hard and money was really running low, she would do something that didn't make sense to me but makes sense to me now. She would throw a party. In the times when time, when money was low, she would throw a party, it was a card party, and people would come to our house, there would be music blaring, there would be people dancing, there would be a lot of fun happening, and I, in my mind, could not really understand what was going on because I was young, but at the end of the night, my mother would have $150, $200. And what I come to realize is that People, everybody would come there. It would be her friends, our family members. They would come. She's throwing a celebration, and they would slowly just give her money. $5 here, $10 there. They knew why she was throwing the party. She was throwing the party because she wanted people to help. And in their overflowing joy, and everybody there was broke too. Everybody there didn't have money. There wasn't nobody, no, there wasn't no daddy Warbucks coming through the house. Everybody there was struggling just like she was. But in community, everybody doing a little helped us get by. In the midst of their poverty, because they was broke, and this party, their overflowing joy, it led to their generosity. That's what was happening in Macedonian, Macedonian churches. They were in poverty, but they didn't have joy. I'm not saying you should throw a car party for the church plants in the People Church Network, but <laughs> what I am saying is that there was poverty in each one of us. Sometimes it's financial poverty. Some of us struggle like that, but some of us just have a poverty in relationships, a poverty of time. You don't have enough of it. Sometimes we're just a poverty of spirit. We're lowly in that way. But the overflowing joy of the Lord inside of us fills in that gap. Say, man. That's what they were experiencing. They had poverty in those ways, but the joy of the Lord had filled in those gaps. So they didn't worry about money because they knew who God was so they could give generously. I don't know what kind of poverty you may have. Maybe it'd be one of those financial poverty or poverty of relationship, poverty of time, poverty in the spirit. But know that God, our Father in heaven, can fill in those gaps. That he can put inside you all that you need to get by. And that should lead to your generosity for other people to experience the same. As your generosity flows from here, it allows other people across this globe in different cities to experience the joy of the Lord. Amen? In Macedonia, they were giving so the church in Jerusalem, the first church, could be blessed. I'm asking you and I'm asking everybody online, I want your poverty to lead to generosity so that churches in places we haven't even thought of yet can be birthed 
And people can experience the joy of the Lord in a way that they never thought possible, and it would lead to their generosity. We need you to intercede. We need you to invest. And we need you to invite. Yeah, and I'm, I'm just going to brag on him for a second, not that he needs it or wants it or expected this, but when we were balcony dwellers, we were not tithing. We were not tithing, and one of the first questions that he asked before coming on staff, and he confessed that, he said, I don't even tithe. My wife's generous, but I don't even tithe, so what, do you, are you sure I'm the right guy? And, you know, it, it took a little bit, but he is... He is not going to disappoint the Lord. So we definitely started Amen. tithing. <laughs> From day one on staff, I was not going to be a hypocrite. No. If I'm telling other no. people to tithe, I'm tithing. Yeah, yeah. And it, it has to be clear on that. Yes, yes. And it. No. Yeah, he's come a long way. He's come a long way. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. So your second service will have a whole group just laugh at that because in, he's heard this. They've heard this story, and it, it is absolute truth. He, is, he has come to open up his whole hand, which is great. So uh, the last thing we're going to talk about is, is an invitation, right? So I want to ask you some questions from Romans 10, 14, and 15. And I'm sure you've read this before, but I want you to hear it as though someone is asking you this perhaps from a stage in a large group gathering, and you have to think about your response. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Amen. So have you ever thought, why is it worded that way? You know, these questions are thought-provoking, yes, and they might stir a few people to say, what should I do with that? And that's why it's written that way, right? The goal is that the church would grow, the church would mature, the church would expand, and we have a role in that. And thankfully, somebody, knowingly or unknowingly, responded to those questions correctly. Had they not responded, we would not be a part of a church family. Had our first pastor's mother-in-law not invited us to church, we may not have accepted salvation for decades. We might have missed the opportunity to come on staff. We might have missed a lot of entry points. Amen. But thank God somebody heard or read or felt the spirit nudge them to respond. That's right. So as you think about that, some of you are like, so you want me to go out and invite everybody I know? Yes, yeah. actually, yeah. Sure. I do. I am infamous for inviting people from work, direct employees, coworkers, bosses, doesn't really matter. I let the Lord lead me in what I should ask, and then I ask the question, and then I open the door, because that is what we are called to do. There's not a separation between my church persona and my work persona. So Amen. when they have trouble and they need prayer, they know where to go. Amen. So... The next set of questions are not in the scriptures, but I'm going to ask you anyway, because this is, a, this is a season to jump in, as Reggie said. So, when was the last time you invited somebody to church? When was the last time you shared a word with somebody? Didn't have to be at church. Like I said, it could be at work, could be at home, could be in a grocery store. God's everywhere, so wherever you go. As you think about those questions, they're not intended to be condemning. They are intended to make you wonder, what else were you doing instead of those things, right? Right. And then the other question that we take extremely seriously is, are you actively discipling anyone? Uh -huh. We got a couple commands from the Lord, and that was one of them, to go and make disciples. Now, many of us may not be sent as far away as Jamila to a culture we don't know and a language we have to learn. You know, some of us will just go to work. Some of us will go to the grocery store. But it's important that we are thoughtful about what we are saying, when we are saying it, when the Lord opens the door so that we can extend that invitation. And the other side of it is, if you're not just going to offer an invitation, which is not a small thing, I'm going to say just because we just talked about how hard it was to church plant, 
is the Lord calling you to do more? Mm. Is he calling you to start a church? In 2001, we would have said, absolutely not. Mm. <laughs> That's not what we do. We're scientists. We don't plant churches. Um, <laughs> no. But the Lord will equip us to do whatever he wants us to do. Amen. And so, for you entrepreneurs who are starting to feel a little confident, you're like, yeah, I could do that. I started a business. I could do that. Yeah, I'm sure I'd be successful. You can. You can, and hold that thought, because <laughs> he is one too. And for those of you who are more concerned about what does that even look like, I don't even, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think that's what I'd like to do. I encourage you to let that fall to the ground. And if you can do all things with the Lord, really ask him honestly, transparently, is that what you have for me? Is that what you want for me and my family? And if so, I receive the call to go and do the work that you have placed in me before the beginning of time to complete. Amen. We have that ability because it is the spirit that dwells within us that completes this work. We are not doing it alone. We will not be left and we will not continue to not respond. Right. We are a church of action. And if we're going to jump in, that's how we do it. So whether he calls you to go, he calls you to just invite, or he calls you to seriously plant and plan, just know that he is with you and you are not alone. That's right. right. Church planning is hard, but church planning is kingdom. And that's why we do it. And those who are called to church plant, they don't do it alone. They do it with the body of believers like you. And in People's Church Network, we do it from the strength of Uptown to the mobility of L.A., to the creativeness in South Africa, to the grit that's in Honduras. We do it with the full body of Christ, of racially reconciling peoples who come together and know that the restoration of our relationship with the Lord is vertical, but he also made it horizontal and that we need to love one another, specifically those who are different than us. We invite you to pray about continuing your participation through interceding. Pray for us. Pray with us. We ask you to invest through access giving above and beyond your tithes so that other people can feel the joy of the Lord that you feel so that they can know who Christ is. We ask you to invite for that same reason. They won't know unless you invite them. They won't have the opportunity to experience what God really wants to do in their lives unless somebody tells them God is real. Let me show you. And if the Holy Spirit invites you to plant a church, you don't have to have a seminary degree to start. You don't have to know everything that you're going to do in the beginning. You just got to take that first step. Pastor Reggie said, jump in. Just jump in. If we do those things, God the Father will make the increase. If we do our part, he's going to allow the kingdom that he is building to increase to the ends of the earth. We don't have to worry about that. But we do have to jump in. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the call that you've had on our lives, Lord. To be church planners, Lord. To be people who invest in the kingdom. To be people who intercede and pray for those who go, Lord. To invite those who need to be a part of your body. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to partner with you in all that you are doing. And Lord, I pray for everyone here under the sound of my voice, everyone who's watching online. Lord, I pray that you would speak to them, bless them, help them to take that next step to continue to press forward in what you have 
for their lives and what you want from them so that your kingdom can come and your will be done. Lord, I pray that you bless them, that you keep them right now. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.